Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Ian Hall. I'm the acting director of the Griffith Asia Institute. Before we start, I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I would also like to uh, acknowledge our distinguished guests from the, uh, Her Excellency, of course, Mrs. Nila Chohan, uh, His Excellency, Mr. Musa Chohan, uh, for our guests from the diplomatic community in Brisbane and further afield, Ms. Maud Page, Deputy Director, Collector of Ex and Exhibitions, Quagoma, here, where we meet, Mr. Aaron Sito, Curatorial Manager, Asia and Pacific Art at Queensland Art Gallery and Gallery of Modern Art. I am very pleased and we're always pleased to acknowledge our wonderful Perspectives Asia partner, the Australian Centre of Asia Pacific Art, Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery of Modern Art, with which we are once again delighted to be co-hosting this event. I'd like to thank uh, Julian Rosenthal out there in the, in the lobby for performing the cello during the reception. Julian's a graduate of the Queensland Conservatorium uh, and Griffith University. And last but not least, I would like to thank our sponsor, Yearing Station. So welcome everyone to the fourth Perspectives Asia for 2016. Before I start, I'm gonna give a little advertisement for the next one. Uh, our next Perspectives Asia will be held on the 22nd of September in conjunction with the Brisbane Festival and we'll discuss popular culture and the representation of Asian Australia. Now since its inception, the Perspectives Asia series has hosted a diverse range of speakers on various topics that look at Australia's relationships, various different relationships with its Asian neighbours. It aims to provide an insight into the development of new perspectives in dealing with the changing conditions and issues fa facing our region. To that end, and I want to emphasise that this is a conversation and an active one, we encourage you to continue that conversation, join it and share your comments in the various different ways that you can. We've got the hashtags and Twitter accounts and so on and so forth, so we can all engage in social media here and beyond. Now this evening, we are honoured to host Her Excellency Nella Chohan, Pakistan's High Commissioner to Australia. Mrs Chohan is a seasoned diplomat, a prominent activist, for activist Active, oh, sorry, advocate for gender equality and an accomplished artist. She served in eight missions on five continents in capitals as far flung as Kuala Lumpur, Ottawa and Tehran, as well as the United Nations in New York. Her art has been exhibited across the world as well in Buenos Aires, in Kuala Lumpur and Ottawa. Her work, Souffrance, which I roughly <coughs> translated, my French is a little rusty, as pain or sickness or suffering, it means multiple different things, which, is, which I was thinking about this morning, <laughs> is on permanent display at UNESCO's headquarters in Paris. Mrs. Chahan's work has been described by UNESCO, by UNESCO's Bureau of Strategic Planning Section for Women and Gender Equality as, quotes, a reflection on the position of women in society, illiteracy, economic empowerment, and women's contribution to society and the discrimination that they face. In this evening's talk, which we are very, very proud to present, Mrs. Chahan will discuss her art and the ways in which her roles as an artist and as a diplomat, uh, the arts and public diplomacy can communicate and engage communities in Australia, in Pakistan and in our broader region, and in particular highlight, empower and give voice to women. Mrs. Chahan. Good evening. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Hall. I deeply appreciate what the Asia Institute is doing. Uh, advocacy, advocacy through art, empowerment of women. But before I go into that, I would, I would like to recognize Captain Casper uh, Nipper, uh, Honorary Consul of Netherlands, Professor Ian Hall, Maud Page, wonderful friends from DFAT, from Diplomatic Corps, and from the art world. Thank you so much for being here. I would also like to thank the Griffith Inst Asia Institute of the Griffith University, the Australian Centre for Asia Pacific Art, in collaboration with GOMA for inviting me to participate in this Perspectives Asia. 
art from the heart. That is what it is. People have different concepts of what diplomacy is from the 16th, 17th, 18th century European diplomacy. Uh, the concept of being diplomat is somebody who's not very straight and who has the art of telling the lie in a convincing way. <laughs> but the modern day diplomacy is different. If you are not sincere, if you're not honest, you're not credible. And if you're not credible, then you cannot do for your country what it needs. So you have to be honest and you have to be sincere. Uh, how did I get into art? I was never an artist. Uh, my mother painted and as kids we saw her paint. But I myself was a science student who <laughs> was far away from art. But then when we were posted to New York in the United Nations, I was dealing with the third committee of the UN General Assembly, which deals with women's issues, amongst other issues. It has social and humanitarian focus on human rights, on rights to self-determination, and so on. And when I sat there in the committee meeting and I saw different countries present their reports about the status of women, I realized the universality of the problems. I believe that manifestation can be different depending on the level of education, the traditional norms, uh, the environment, and by environment I mean socio-psychological environment more than environment as we talk about global climatic change. Uh, so there was this anguish that I wanted to do something other than what we were doing at UN. And I decided to practice painting. So I joined art schools, started from Malaysia. Uh, and then my husband was posted as ambassador to France. And I was, as they say, en chômage technique, <laughs> which means that I was jobless. I was not posted. <laughs> and you know, artists have that intensity, particularly when they're jobless and they have no money. <laughs> and living off my husband. Um, I had chosen to do so basically because my kids were very small and I could have taken a separate posting, but I did not. Uh, for the sake of children and to keep the family together. Uh, but the kids were not so small that they needed me 24 hours. You know, they were at school having games, coming home late. And the husband was in the office. He had even forgotten that I was his colleague. So <laughs> he would not talk shop with me at all. So I felt kind of marginalized. And um, I said, no, this is not on. I'm not going to settle with that. So I joined L'Ecole de Louvre to study l'histoire de l'art. And then I joined L'Ecole de Beaux-Arts. And uh, I was still not satisfied. So <laughs> I started with PhD also. <laughs> and um, I started expressing myself of all the experiences that had accumulated within. and. I thought that one stroke of brush speaks more than thousand words. So whether you know the language or not, you can always relate. Uh, and I will show you some of my works, and I'll be asking you questions, because I'm not a teacher, Professor Ian. So <laughs> I, I want it to be an interactive session. and. The first painting that I'm going to show you. It's a painting that I did in Argentina. And uh, when I painted it, I had this very nice friend. You might have heard of uh, Jorge Luis Borges, uh, who was a famous Argentinian writer. Although, if you look at his life history, he wasn't really Argentinian, but 
Argentinians claim him, <laughs> and I don't debate it. And his second wife was a Japanese, Maria Kodama, who was a very good friend. And Maria Kodama, when she looked at it, and I said, Maria, tell me what should be the name of this painting. And she said, Presencia Abstracta, which means abstract presence. So I've translated it for you. I want you to tell me what you see in this painting. Any volunteers? Yes, please. I'm so impressed <laughs> because normally when I ask people, somebody say, oh, is it a tooth? <laughs> Some people tell me, oh, is it an embryo? Uh, you know, so different people react differently. So I'm impressed that you immediately saw it. And I don't know if the pointer can show. Where is the pointer? Does it work here? Oh, sorry. Uh, no, it, it just moves. It's not a pointer. You see, uh, the body shape is with red. And that red flows into the leaves. And what I'm trying to say is that, you know, these are different echelons of the society, different ways, different sectors, and she's nurturing it. And yet you don't see her. So her presence is always abstract. And uh, that's why I thought the abstract presence, because if you talk to economists, they say that uh, the world's economy is being run by women. Of course, they blame that we are good shoppers. But more than that, <laughs> we contribute in many ways. And yet, our role, our participation is not as recognized as it should be. So this was my last painting that I had done in Argentina. This is another painting. It's called Entrapment of Traditions. And if you look at the painting, you may see a woman there who is not looking at you. She is angry. That's why she has turned her face away. But you can see the red line, which are the barriers. Different societies have different forms of barriers. And uh, there is silver you know, kind of scribble, because if you see the history of civilizations, you would find very few women who have been recognized for their intellectual work. And women's work is often seen as scribbles, you know, oh, she has nothing better to do, kind of an attitude. While she may be equally intelligent and may be doing a lot of things, but her thoughts, her words, her research is not given that kind of uh, recognition that she deserves. And then you can see it's a collage, basically. You can see the bangles and the beautiful dress because we women are supposed to look pretty, not very smart. And uh, the traditions tell you, you know, I, I wasn't like this when I was young. I was very tomboyish, and I <laughs> was very rebellious uh, against these uh, dresses that I now wear, uh, because uh, at that time, I thought, no, I'm, I'm not going to be, you know, typified or stereotyped. Uh, but uh, it's the social orientation, it's the social psyche that tells you to behave in certain way. And deep down, you're made to be a conformist. And if you're not, then you are criticized by uh, everybody. So these are entrapments of traditions, as I see it, which make women into a role. And then the worst is that the same woman who as a young person uh, rebels, then ensures that the younger ones are brought into the same mold. 
So women become biggest critics of each other. Uh, and uh, you would see that in different, if, if, I mean, from anthropological point of view, that it's the elder women who will always criticize. It was, it's always the mother-in-law who would criticize the daughter-in-law, and so on and so forth, because this is how societies are built. Uh, I'm not against that, because that's what makes a society a society. Uh, roles are important, gender roles are important, but what I often question is that it should not limit people should have choice to play the role they choose for themselves in whichever societies they are. So this one, this is called ignorance. And you can see the woman has her eyes closed. I often use eyes as also connectivity. So when I'm saying eyes closed means that she's not aware of her environment. She's not seeing what's happening. Uh, and her scarf is up in the air. Scarf for me, because we have scarf as part of our you know, dress, it's also a dignity of woman. But here what I'm saying is that it's not about being illiterate. I'm talking about education. And education is much more than just being illiterate. And often, Women uh, in particular, but people in general, are not aware of their rights. They're not aware of the rules and regulations. They're not aware of the provisions that are there that they could use. And they still tread on the traditional path rather than understanding what are their rights. Whether you talk in the religious context or you talk in socio-political context, uh, many a times we constrain ourselves, many a times we fall in traps because we are really ignorant. We don't know how many rights we really have and how we could use them. So this is what provoked me to paint this work. This is called Struggle. And if you can see their phases, there's a woman with her head totally on the ground, a woman who is slightly higher, and then it's a woman who is Olympic <laughs> champion. So uh, what I'm saying is that women all over the world, there are many who have achieved uh, very high targets, but there are many who are still struggling. And uh, it's basically that depiction. Uh, recently I did an exhibition in Canberra and I called it Arise Women because we can stand up. We can take opposition provided we break away from that mental orientation that our society imposes upon us. Uh, this is the dancing puppet and uh, the stronger the strings, the better the dance. <laughs> you know, S the stage is set by the society, and uh, you dance. You dance as you have been trained. But it's basically telling you, do you really want to be the wonderful dancing puppet, or you want to be a person who can decide for him or herself. Uh, in my works, I've also used a lot of uh, Islamic concepts because there's a lot of misunderstanding about Islam, uh, especially women in Islam. Uh, now, this word, botan, is from the Quran, and it means slander. And in our I mean, I'm a Muslim. So in our faith, to slander someone is a sin. Not only is it a sin, it's a crime punishable by law. How many a times have you seen anybody being punished 
for slandering any woman. I've yet to see any. Why? Because we take it for granted. It's so much fun to gossip, especially if there's a successful woman. You will have stories and stories about her, how she made it to where she is. And irrespective of whether you're a woman or a man, uh, they all gossip. Men gossip if a woman is in a man's world and doing well. And women gossip uh, because obviously those who are not in that advantageous position believe that perhaps this woman who is successful managed her way through by the other way rather than accepting that she could be equally smart and capable of managing her way the right way. So you can see she's almost nude. When I was painting it, it was very interesting. My s older son was about 10 years old, and he walked up and he started looking at it and said, Mom, are you painting a nude? <laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> because I wasn't thinking of a nude. But what I was trying to say was that it's so easy to undress a woman by slandering her character. So the slanders are those, you know, the stains that are there. Um, and every society you find it that pe people gossip, people slander. And how many times do we really think that perhaps the person who is successful has made it through hard work? Uh, so, this is another one. Uh, this I painted, I think, in 2000. At that time, the Twin Towers were still there. I didn't know what would ha I mean, what came subsequently. So these are the Twin Towers that I had painted because I had been in New York and, you know, so this was symbol of a civilization and then pyramids also symbol of civilization, ancient civilization. So what I was trying to say was that since time immemorial, situation of women all over the world hasn't changed much uh, because the attitudes, I mean, we have technology, we have lifestyle changes, but actually as human beings, how much has changed when it comes to attitude? And uh, there are still many women in every part of the world who continue to suffer. Some are recognized, some sufferings are recognized, some are not. And that's what we need to look at, that if we call ourselves civilized people, how much are we doing to really make our societies, uh, you know, to be able to claim that arrogant stance that yes, we are civilized. This is ethnic genocide. Uh, you have seen that uh, many a places uh, rape is used as instrument of war, whether it's in Kashmir, whether it's in Bosnia, whether it's in Rwanda. Uh, and the pod in the middle is basically symbolic of woman because she carries the babies, as does the pod carry the seeds. And uh, the blood is what is rape about, in, in my interpretation. And the seeds then, you know, how many refugees you get, how many, uh, you know, the destruction of the societies uh, in conflict situation, uh, which really destroys the minds and those children who are forced to become refugees, orphans, how do they deal with those traumas? And the women who are raped, how does she deal with it? And that's a challenge. Even in modern day time, it's not an old story. Every day it's happening. And the worst is that it's an instrument of war. That's deplorable, and I think we have to look at it seriously. Um, every day you read newspapers, every day you hear stories, what's happening, 
And why is it that women and children who have nothing to do with the war are the basic victims and targets in war situations? This is the painting that is in Paris, in UNESCO. And the title was Encaged, the exhibition uh, that I had held was called Souffrance. Um, and here, if you see, there is this cage. And then if you see the woman's head, the shape is not quite different. And there are different colors. Uh, red I often use for pain. Uh, gold is, you know, dignity, royalty, in our cultures, this is a color we use. Uh, and then there's the dark side. And what I'm trying to say is that yes, in societies there is pain. There's also dignity, there are also good values. But the problem is within us, the mind, many a times we constrain ourselves and that is where we are encaged. We are our own prisoners. We need to break away from those norms that imprison us within ourselves and be free to be able to make that change in our lives and lives around us. Uh, so engagement is not necessarily from outside. Engagement is many a times from within. And it's the within that we need to fight against. It's, it's an internal conflict that we need to develop and say, no, I can do it. And believe me, if you do it, you will be able to do it. It's just taking that courage and standing up. And this is again a word from Quran, fikr. Fikr means to think, and think is for all men and women. Although if you look at cliches, women are supposed to be of lesser intellect. Women are not supposed to think, they are just supposed to look pretty and that's enough. But that's not what God wants you to do. God wants you to think, to find your right place. But how many of us really know that? How many uh, of preachers will tell you that? They will think it's a heresy that, oh, thinking women, they're dangerous, they're monsters, <laughs> you know? But that's not how God made us. He gave us brains to use, and we need to use that. And that's what it's about. And I deliberately used the traditional and religious uh, context in it because I reject those who say that women are not supposed to think, women don't have right to think. Of course I'll think, who can stop me from thinking? And God wants me to think. So that's what it is about. So <laughs> this is my statement. And this, many people think, oh, is it a self-portrait? <laughs> and I said, no, it's just a woman. I'm just a woman, and pain of any woman anywhere in the world, irrespective of her religion, of her ethnicity, of the region she belongs to, that's me, because I can relate to it, just as I'm sure you would have related to the points that I have tried sharing with you through my art. And last but not the least, the shared anguish. And again, here you see there are two faces, one with the eyes closed and one with the eyes open. Eyes open are those who have the opportunities. And you can see the face colors could be different because it's not about ethnicity or religion or nationality. It's about having that ability to stand up, the ability to see yourself in the right perspective. And there are women who have their eyes closed because perhaps it's that self-engagement, perhaps 
their conditions are such that they have not had the opportunity, but they are both tied by the same veil as women because we need to share. And those who have the opportunities, we should think about those who have lesser options, not to be condescending and think, oh, she didn't do that, I did it. It's not about that. It's about standing in the shoes of the person who is suffering and feel it and try to help. In Australia, when I came, I, did a, I heard about Rosie Betty and I was devastated by her story. Many nights I couldn't sleep. How could a woman go through that kind of pain? And I did a painting which I haven't presented here on domestic violence. And then I contacted Rosie Betty and she came to Canberra and we had this art exhibition. And I entitled it Betrayal of Love because domestic violence, whether against the women or children, it's the trust that is betrayed. Uh, so that painting was auctioned and all the proceeds went to Rosie Betty. But what I'm trying to say is that it doesn't matter whether you're of Asian or Australian, uh, it's about being human and about having the same feelings and reaching out to each other. Thank you so much. Everyone will agree with me that um, it's not often that we hear something, as you said, from the heart. And it's not often, too, that we have to pause and think about our humanness first before perhaps a political or a national title. And I think that that's very important. We're here in Perspectives Asia. We do usually hear a lot about facts and figures and what's happening and the latest kind of diplomatic news and how we're going to cope with certain events. But I think all of your talk for me was something that was deeply personal. I took it as comments about Pakistan, but I also took it about very human comments. And I think you did start by, well, you did end actually by saying this is my statement. So that we sometimes, and this is the role of art as well, we have to think differently so that you've made us tonight think differently because we had to all think about what your work meant, listen to you, but also we were trying to position it as humans do in a probably in a national context. And it was good not to be able to do that and to come back and revert back to something more human. So I thank you for that and I would like to open um, to any questions that people may have. Yes, that's a very good question. Um, I'm married to a writer, a poet, and a, form, a diplomat who is very nocturnal. <laughs> and I was the kind of a person who used to go to sleep at uh, nine in the evening. And then I married a guy who wouldn't sleep till three in the morning with the TV on, the radio on. It was a party time. And I didn't know what to do. <laughs> So I said, might as well, if he's being creative and doing his poetry with, you know, all the music, I just took out the brushes and I said, okay, I'll paint. So you could say I live two lives. One is the day life where I'm a diplomat and uh, the evening when I'm an artist just by myself, when the phones have stopped ringing and people have stopped asking questions about different things that I can paint and just, it's more of a form of meditation also. It's very relaxing, it's therapeutic as well. Thank you. It might help. <laughs> 
Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my art is basically universal, at least I think so. Although I've used expressions from my traditions, but I'm sure all of you could relate to it. Uh, uh, climate change is a big threat to the planet. And I totally agree with it, that women have important role to play, uh, even in agriculture. Mm because women all over the world, particularly in Asia, I could say, and Africa, uh, are very much involved in farming. And if they are not educated, if they do not understand uh, the implications of things they do, of course, uh, traditional wisdom is very important. Uh, because uh, the way the ancestors did things, whether here, the Aborigine women, or in other parts of the world, uh, women are the cementing force. And not only in their own capacity as an individual, but also as a mother who then transmits the traditional values and wisdom to the next generation. So it's very important to have women educated and made conscious of what implications there are for the actions they do. Uh, and I think a lot of work, at least I can say for Pakistan, we are doing on women and empowerment of uh, women in agriculture uh, because we are an agro-based uh, economy. So it is an important role. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, you mentioned that you took up your artwork after your career as a diplomat had started. So I'm interested to know, has it changed, has being an artist changed the way you practice diplomacy? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's vice versa. <laughs> um, I just like being myself. Uh, I haven't ever categorized myself as a diplomat or as an artist. I'm humbled by these very kind remarks that I get that I'm an artist. My husband definitely doesn't think so. He calls it a torture camp. <laughs> because whenever he has to live in my art, he says, oh my God, I'm tortured. <laughs> you know? um, but. Uh, I suppose the artist was always there, although the expression came later. Uh, so that perspective towards life, that attitude was always there. It needed expression and I found it. Thank you so much. There's one question in the middle. Well, that's a very important question. I don't know if I have the answer. 
because uh, this is a universal issue. Anybody who rocks the boat is a threat. Mm -hmm. And artists, musicians, uh, mm -hmm. writers, they do challenge the norms and it disturbs the comfort zone because we all have our own comfort zones. Anything that threatens it makes it uncomfortable, makes it uncomfortable for us. So we feel threatened, <laughs> and when we feel threatened, we become aggressive. And uh, what you're talking about is basically tolerance and giving each other that space that even if you don't agree with what I'm saying, or what an artist says, or what a writer says, or what a poet says, uh, respect the other views. And that again, I think, zeroes down, in my view, to education. Educating people to be tolerant about different thoughts. You know, people who think out of the box. We need to give them that space in every society. Thank you. I hope I've satisfied your heart. Yes. Queensland, <coughs> women were given voting rights quite early, more than a hundred years ago, but they were not yet able or allowed to stand for parliament. My question is a very simple one. Do you also paint men? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think I have done that. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, no, I haven't done that. <laughs> Didn't inspire me. I'm sorry, Mr. Brendan. <laughs> <laughs> Another question at the back. Just <laughs> <laughs> There's still some time to go. <laughs> yes. I have a question. Um, uh, one of the important things about um, female artists is that they have to be able to Well, uh, people from uh, Goma can tell you they are working with artists in Pakistan and most of the works they have are from women, mm -hmm. uh, middle, middle class women. Uh, with us, uh, you know, uh, people don't really understand what Pakistan is about. We are relatively a new country because we got independence in 1947, just as India did. But we are an ancient civilization. And in our social psyche, music and art have always played an important role. If you look at European history and l'histoire de l'art in Europe, the evolution was different. It was more from religious uh, sponsorships, you know, from the clergy that artists were sponsored and made uh, their works. Uh, with us, it was a way of life. And of course, uh, <laughs> religious paintings were there, but they were not sponsored by any religious authority because we didn't have the clergy system in our societies. So, it's a way of life. It's, uh, we always find expression in art and music. Uh, and women in Pakistan, in contemporary times, are doing wonderful experiments in taking old traditions, like even now I saw some of the works here. But in Pakistan, I have seen that uh, they are taking uh, old traditions of uh, doing the miniature work mm. and interpreting it in contemporary daily life. So uh, this uh, experimentation, in my view, is very important for the growth of art 
yet guarding the tradition. I'll add to that that in the in our last Asia Pacific Triennial, I don't know if any of you saw, but there was some incredibly beautiful, very small paintings this big. Some people couldn't find them, but they were beautifully placed just upstairs in our galleries. And it was by a woman called Risham Sayed. And she had painted the back of houses in Lahore. So talking about the development, huge development that was happening on land, but also the way that we were so often um, conscious about the front of houses, but not so much the backs, because the back, no one saw them, so it didn't matter. So make a real comment on society, but also the growth of cities and a whole lot of things mixed together. And I'd like to add that every artist that we've met also teaches, so the, there's an incredible, I think, intellectual kind of movement in, in Pakistan that has been there for a long time, and the person that we've been dealing in Pakistan, um, I've forgotten her name, Salima Hashmi, has been working as a dean, she's been working as the head of a national gallery, so women seem to be in Pakistan very highly regarded in the arts and have had an incredible influence throughout not only in the artworks themselves and as artists but also in the teaching, so that's, it's wonderful to see your work in that context as well and what you discuss by bringing politics and family together because that is really another very important part of your talk. Were there any other questions? We've got a few, maybe. Thank you for your talk. At the beginning of your talk, you said that it was one of the main motivations for your work and to become a painter was anguish, and this really urged to change something. And I'm really invited that you were using all these reports and very good examples in your similar visions into each other. And I was just wondering, so what do you think that your art contributed? Has it contributed to some change? Or do you think that? Will the art uh, made by women for me can make some change? What were the things you have in common from what you did from us for many men on this art? Can it decide some change, legal change, or it's more about doing some sort of social <coughs> justice for women by recognizing their suffering and their discussion? You see, um, art is a subtle advocacy. Mm -hmm. And it affects subtly. Um, it's difficult to, you know, quantify it in tangible terms, but I have seen people who later informed me that, you know, it gave them an idea, it gave them a thought that helped them do certain things to help women in their communities. So I myself had not done that, but through my art, it created that motivation <coughs> for people on the ground to be able to do things. There's a hand there at yes, the end. At the end. <laughs> no, you. <laughs> As I said, I'm just another woman. And then I see all these beautiful women all over the world. And when I reach out to them, and that sparkle in the eyes, and that desire to be able to do something, to bring a change, that's what is my muse. That's what is my motivation. I think we couldn't end on a better way. <laughs>So on behalf of me, Maud Page from the Queensland Art Gallery and also thanking um, Professor Ian Hall and the Griffith Asia, Asia Institute, Natasha Berry, another wonderful woman. And on behalf of all of us, thank you for your humbling talk. It's a really been a wonderful, wonderful evening. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you.